Hi, welcome back to, back to Midweek Encouragement. Glad that you could join us as we continue to look at the 37 miracles of Jesus. And what would it look like if you, for the past 30 days, tried to see the activity of God in your life on each of those days? And <clears throat> I think if we'd slow down, we would see <clears throat> that there were at least 30 miracles in our life uh, just in the last 30 days. Uh, 30 times God showed up and you were unaware of, uh, or we didn't even think about that Jesus was the one that made the miracle happen. Maybe it's that there was a close call of an accident and you were not involved in the accident. But I think waking up every day is a miracle because life is a miracle. Uh, even if you reflected on a week where you where are you seeing the evidence of Jesus, Acts chapter 1, Theophilus said that Jesus presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. And I believe that that's what Jesus is doing every day to us. He's given us many convincing proofs that he is alive. This is why I think we ought to look at the miracles of Jesus and even the miracles of the Old Testament so that we would see the miracles we are talking about and we see the miracles in our life. And the greatest miracle is the fact that Jesus loves me and that Jesus loves you. Uh, Jesus in, uh, is, in his back and forth across the Red, uh, across the sea, He one day he lands at the shore of uh, uh, Gennesart, I believe it's pronounced. And we read about this in Mark chapter 5, verse 33. 53. When they had crossed over, they landed at G G Gennesart and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched were healed. As soon as they landed, the people recognized it's Jesus. And I, I think that was part of the issue today. People don't see it's Jesus making things happen. And then the people went and they gathered the sick and they placed him in his path so that the sick uh, only had to reach out and touch the hem of his garment and they were made well. Imagine Jesus is trying to get from point A to point B and the people just are tossing their friends in the path and, uh, and people were touching Jesus and they were being healed. I think what we could do is not put just others in the path of Jesus, but maybe we need to put ourselves there sometimes. God is always moving, and it says in Matthew 25, he's moving towards the hungry people, the strange people, the thirsty people, the naked people, the sick people, the imprisoned people, and that's his, that are in his path. And the beauty is, if you place yourself around hungry people, strange people, thirsty people, naked people, sick people, jailed people, you're going to encounter Jesus because that is the path that he's walking on. He said, when you have done this to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. What do hungry people, thirsty people, naked people, sick people, jailed people look like? Uh, they may not just be physically hungry. They may just be starving for someone to see them, starving for someone to love them. The thirsty uh, aren't just looking for water. They need the living water that Jesus has to offer. But sometimes you're the sip that they need for the day. The naked people, they may, may not need jeans or a shirt, but they been exposed and they need someone to cover them. Their dignity has been lowered and they need someone to cover them. There are those who are mentally sick and those who uh, just need a lot of grace and mercy. There are those who are jailed, but not behind steel bars. They have been held captive by their addictions or hurts or habits or the words of other people. And instead of walking by on the so other side of the road, as in the parable of the Good Samaritan, we need to stop and do something with our time, our talent, our treasure, and our touch. We begin to show love and mercy and grace that has been shown to us. We, we don't need to be in the proximity of our faith or, or other believers. I want Jesus to touch me. How does he do that? He uses people and circumstances, and he will drop people into our life, sometimes difficult people, and he uses them to touch a part of you that needs to be uncovered. Have you ever picked up a porcupine? Neither have I, and it's not on my bucket list either. But if you were going to pick up a 
porcupine. You would wear some really, really thick leather gloves and you might even put a blanket over them before you pick them up because when a porcupine gets scared or is being defensive, it sticks out its quills and you don't want to get poked by those. And sometimes there are people that we meet that are kind of porcupine-ish. They're sticking out their quills. They're a little bit rough. We're afraid to get near them. And what we need to do is put a blanket of grace around them. The blanket of grace that has been given to us and probably several layers of those blankets, we wrap it around them. And they may not remember what made them so prickly, but they'll remember the blanket of grace that you gave them. I think the challenge here is to ask Jesus to touch the areas of our lives that we would rather no one else know about. Could you touch this broken relationship? Could you help me overcome this fear in my life? We have, have to see it uh, so that we can understand it, so that we can bring it for Jesus to touch. And the challenge is for us to get in the path of Jesus. And I think with the miracles, we need to try to place ourselves in the story and imagine what it must have been like to be touched by the power of God. It's tempting to be one who brings Jesus to others when sometimes the person who really needs to encounter him is you. So um, I think what we need to do is turn a little inward and focus on ourselves and bring ourselves to Jesus. Where are you hurting? What is missing in your life? What are you longing for? What are you grieving over? What disappointments still rattle you? Uh, bring those things to Jesus and listen to his voice and allow yourself to be open to him and his direction. Ask him to give you uh, the vulnerable courage to allow him access to the hurting places in your life. He's walking down the path towards you. Reach out your hand and touch his garment. To be healed, you've got to walk with the healer. And when you are healed, you can become a healer. The people mentioned in the miracle were healed of their physical ailments. We, and when we step into the path of Jesus and we reach out and touch the hem of his garment, he's able and willing to heal more than our physical ailments. So to become well, we must spend considerable regular time with the healer. We must be in a position to hear from him. When we, what might be blocking his voice from your ears? And when you holler at each other from <clears throat> the other side of the house, and the other person, and a person you're hollering at is in another room, we can't hear them. But what we have to do is we have to go to where they are because the walls are blocking the sound. And when we get near the source, we remove the obstacles. Obstacles of unconfessed sin, unforgiveness, anger, and more. We're invited to dwell in the secret place of the Most High God. Psalms 91 says, Blessed are those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High God. They will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And this rest is a peace that we cast, but the shadow is only as broad as the proximity of yourself to the Father. Do you carry peace? And what does that look like? Is it something others would want to be around? I firmly believe with all that is within me that God is still speaking, and he wants us to hear him. One person said that God is an extrovert. In John, he says, my sheep know my voice. Uh, now, here's the rub. Maybe you are listening to the wrong voice. I learned a long time ago that if I am literally holding the microphone, I can't let go of it. Because if I let go of it, somebody else has control they have control of what's going to be said. I've lost my authority as the one who's supposed to be speaking. So don't let the wrong person speak into your life. Make sure you're hearing the right voice. And the danger is sometimes we are listening to the wrong whisper. Um, in Matthew 8, 27, it says, God whispers, but in Psalm 36 or 39, it says, sin also whispers. So the way to hear the whisper is you gotta be close to the one that's whispering. And are you hearing from God or are we hearing from the evil one? And the problem is when we are hearing from the evil one, he's casting doubt into what we think we're hearing. I'm reminded of the life of Moses. <clears throat> and uh, as they were leaving Egypt and everybody's wanting to go back to Egypt, they're wanting to go back to the bondage and slavery, which really makes no sense to me, but I wasn't there. So pursuing pursue God like you have... Um, um, 
yet like you always have isn't necessarily wrong. Pursuing God like you always have isn't necessarily wrong, but you need to find a new song. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And the Bible tells us, sing to the Lord a new song. So I think we need to be very conscious in our prayer life. And that's why I, I and others encourage that we journal our prayer life. So we'll see uh, if you're just responding repeating the same thing over and over. And that's what the pagans do. Jesus said that in Matthew 6. The pagans uh, think that God will hear them because they're many, many words. Prayer is to be simple. So don't overcomplicate it. Uh, be, being present-centered is not a program. Think about what God is doing in your life. Where are you seeing him active? God is speaking through his word, through godly friends, through a still small voice. But you have to slow down and you have to listen to him. You have to want to hear what is God showing you in your life? As the children of Israel wandered for 40 years, there was this pillar of fire by night and a pillar by, of cloud by day. And I think it was more than just a directional arrow from, for them. I think it was protection and direction. Because at night in the desert, when the sun goes down, it gets very cold. So there was a pillar of fire offering some warmth to them. And during the day in the hot sun, there was a cloud it wasn't just a small little cloud, I don't think. I think it was pretty major to cover all of them and give them shade. So as you continue to pursue God through prayer, I want to encourage you to start to also pursue God through the memorization of Scripture or the meditation on Scripture. When we put on the full armor of God, the sword is the Word of God. And it has to be uh, committed to memory in our heart. In other words, we need to keep going over and over and over it. Uh, that's called meditation. Or as cows do, they renumerate. They keep going over and over. So um, I think one of the things that God is calling us to do, be careful to not assume you're walking in the light when you're really walking in the darkness. Or maybe you're straddling the fences. In John 1, it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So I want to encourage you to take the time to work at memorizing the word of God and carrying it with you in your mind as, is, as well as in print. And keep adding to your arsenal the word of God by committing it to your heart. Have a great day. Bye-bye.